Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Paul Cabbage, and we're back for another edition of the Thyroid Answers podcast. I have my partner, Dr. Erica Riggleman, mm -hmm. um, live from somewhere in Virginia, right? <laughs> yes, Winchester. Winchester, Virginia. And we are talking about hypothyroidism and depression. It's really common that we see people that come into our practice um, who have hypothyroid symptoms or diagnosed with hypothyroidism who are depressed. Mm -hmm. And some of them are already on antidepressant medications, MAO inhibitors, SSRIs, and still struggling with hypothyroid symptoms to some level. Um, and they're not sure why. And we wanted to kind of tie together why somebody who's got hypothyroid, uh, a hypothyroid condition may wind up experiencing depression. Absolutely. So, and I, I want to throw this out there. There's a lot of thyroid patients when they come in, obviously they're they're gaining weight, they, their hair is falling out, and they just think because they're having those symptoms that that's why they're depressed. But we want to shed some light on, you know, there's a biochemical reason why this is happening in your body. And that often people who have depression, they may not even know that they have an underlying thyroid issue that's even going on. They have been misdiagnosed. And it's totally understandable to be sad, sad depressed. If your hair is falling out, if you're gaining weight, and you're exercising, you're doing everything you need to do, and you still can't feel better, mm -hmm. that's a great reason to be sad and upset and depressed. However, when you have a clinical depression, that is a real issue. And we want to make sure that people understand that it's not necessarily a, a problem. It is a problem, but it's not like it's a mistake, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like, uh oh, your problem is depression. Depression is a result many times of just inappropriate neurotransmitter production or excessive clearance of neurotransmitters. And we need to understand that because giving more neurotrans or giving medications that block neurotransmitter metabolism um, don't fix the underlying problem. And as it is with a lot of SSR medications that uh, cause a pooling of serotonin, you take those long enough, you, then the pooling of serotonin will inhibit the clearance of your fight or flight hormone. So now you become anxious and irritable. Mm -hmm. And so now many, if you're lucky, maybe, if, or not so lucky, somebody may potentially diagnose you as like bipolar because you're depressed and you're anxious and it's real, really caused by chronic inflammation and your medication. So I, and I call it, I've done a, um, a web, a uh, thyroid Thursday uh, video on this on um, medication induced anxiety. And it's from SSRI type medications. So so what are a couple of reasons? Let's, let's tell the, the listeners and the viewers, what's a couple reasons that somebody with a hypothyroid condition might develop depression? I mean, first one is gonna be just chronic inflammation. I mean, systemic inflammation is going to raise all sorts of you know, inflammatory markers, the immune system, which is going to affect the way that serotonin is not only made, it's bind to the receptors as well as the clearance of it. And, you know, when you don't have that bound to the receptor and you don't have that activation, you're going to get that, you know, depression symptoms that go along with it. So chronic inflammation is just going to affect all sorts of processes in the body and depression is just one of them. Right. So if we back up and we talk about ser serotonin is really the kind of the main neurotransmitter people talk about when there's depression. Right. Yeah. And so serotonin is produced from tryptophan. So mm -hmm. tryptophan is used to make serotonin. What a lot of docs don't know is that under a stress condition, the body will take tryptophan and divert it to a different pathway than towards serotonin. Only about <clears throat> maybe 30% of the tryptophan that we eat, absorb into the system actually gets used to, to make serotonin for mood and then melatonin to help support sleep systems. The, by far, the vast majority of tryptophan goes down with something called the kynurenin pathway. Uh, it's about, I think that es it's estimated about 70%. And when tryptophan goes down that pathway, it's actually used um, to make NAD, which is essentially B3. Mm -hmm. It's how the body makes B3. In stress conditions, like a chronic inflammatory state, the body will divert even more tryptophan away from serotonin production and more down this kinderendin pathway. Under stress conditions, 
that tryptophan won't go to make NAD, it'll get stopped along the way. And it can make kynurenin or kynurenic acid, or it can make the more toxic metabolite, something called quinolinic acid, which is neurotoxic, which actually damages the brain. Mm -hmm. So under stress conditions, tryptophan, which many of us associate with serotonin production and sleep, doesn't go down that pathway. It goes down this neurotoxic pathway that causes us to become insulin resistant. It kind of causes damage to our brain. It gives us brain fog, irritability, and that can lead to some depression as well. And there's one other piece that happens along the way with serotonin, which is that feel-good neurotransmitter is the tryptophan that is converted to serotonin under inflammatory conditions, like you said, there's an enzyme called MAO. It's monoamine oxidase. And monoamine oxidase is thought to speed up about 2,000-fold under inflammatory conditions, which means the body is trying to get rid of that serotonin as fast as possible. So it's trying to speed it up out of the system. Isn't and, it, isn't if you have lack of thyroid hormone too, doesn't that also speed up that as well, like less activation to the receptors? I thought I read a study a couple months ago that actually said that lack of having thyroid hormone getting inside the cell will also speed up the breakdown um, with that enzyme. I haven't seen that study, but I wouldn't find that hard to believe. Okay. So it could. Um, but the other piece of that, you might think of, why would the body do, why would we have, an, why would we do these things? Why would tryptophan not go to make a serotonin? Why would, why would we be have being moody and irritable? Mm -hmm. And we talked about that multiple times, right? Mm -hmm. That under a stress situation or an inflammatory condition, the body triggers the cell danger response. It's a natural defense mechanism to protect the body, protect the cellular system. And one of the things it does is it wants to keep, um, is not support healthy cell physiology. And tryptophan would be one of those things that bacteria or viruses could use as a fuel source. So let's get rid of it. Let's produce neurotoxins to kill the organism. So hence, increase quinolinic acid. Mm -hmm. And let's make this person, let's remove their serotonin, their feel-good neurotransmitter, and this person will become sad, they'll become depressed, and one of the things they won't do then is go hang out with their friends, yeah. right? And yeah. potentially cause infection for them. Yeah, so it, that it makes total sense that when your body is is trying to fight something off, or you know, even just just imagine if you get the flu, you want to rest all day. You feel tired and achy, and you don't want to be around people. I mean, if your body is chronically ill or you have chronic inflammation, your body's trying to do the same thing, and that's why it's you know, self-sabotaging your serotonin almost to, to induce that because we often are on the go so much that we, we don't stop to let our bodies do that. So it's, it's got to kick that into gear to make you do that. Yeah, it's definitely believed that it's a, that's a natural process of the body, an innate, of the body's innate intelligence to shut down the health, to shut down the organism, slow it down, make it depressed, mm -hmm. make it sad, make it want to rest and recover so that the body can heal and repair. And it, and it makes sense. It makes tons of sense when you look at it from that perspective. Yeah. Unfortunately, one of the things we do is we tell our doctor, I'm depressed. And the doctor says, well, your thyroid's fine. You look okay. You're probably not exercising enough. Just take this medication because you're probably with a, with a husband or a, a wife and three kids and a job. You're probably just stressed out, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Instead of looking for reasons that the serotonin would either A, not be made, or B, be excess or cleared out excessively fast, we look to just quickly support the, the, the drug. We just say, okay, let's support the serotonin. Let's not let the body metabolize it. But that creates a whole other issue, right? Yeah, it absolutely does. So if somebody, if you pull serotonin, they're on an MAO inhibitor for an extended period of time, what happens to them? They, they're going to create eventually they're going to become anxious, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's another enzyme in the body called COMT, mm -hmm. and that helps us clear our fight or flight neurotransmitters, and ser pooled serotonin actually slows that enzyme down. So mm -hmm. if you slow that enzyme down, you can't get rid of your fight or flight hormones. That's going to trigger more anxiousness, more anxiety, more irritability. It's going to slow down your body's ability to clear estrogen, so that could lead to estrogen dominance. Mm -hmm. and there's just a cascade of problems that can occur as you start to take these SSRI meds or MAO inhibitors 
for an extended period of time. So we're getting rid of, we're potentially reducing one problem and producing a whole bunch more. Yeah, and that's the hard part is when, when a patient actually gets put on one of those antidepressants, there's not an end date. They're not like, all right, your depression is going to be gone on this date. You can stop it. And it's hard to, you know, even working with your doctor to get off one of those. And, you know, I, I never you try to take my patients off their medications. We always work with our doctor if that's something that they're looking for. But it's it's hard once you get on them to actually get your, be able to get your body off of it and then to feel normal once you are off of it. Right. So one of the big things that can trigger hypothyroidism and especially autoimmune attack on the thyroid gland is infections, mm-hmm. right? We talk about GI tract infections, get into the lymph tissue, get the thyroid, triggers autoimmunity. But some of the gut bacteria, the problematic gut bacteria, can also consume as a fuel source, they can consume tryptophan. Yep. So if you have the bacterial consumption of tryptophan, then you don't have the tryptophan being absorbed into the system mm-hmm. that can then be made into serotonin. So you could be depressed. In that situation, the answer, the best answer is probably not an SSRI medication. <laughs> Somebody identifying the fact that A, you have dysbiosis, a bacterial overgrowth in the GI tract, and B, that, hey, it's causing a, trypt- a tryptophan deficiency, and if we get rid of the dysbiosis and then support tryptophan appropriately, we're going to do better, yep, right? Absolutely. And if we clear depression that way. Depression's big, depression's big business. Antidepressants are big business, yeah. so nobody's probably in a big hurry to say, hmm, let's look at solving the issue when we can put them on a lifestyle drug that they wind up having or needing to take for an extended period of time. Yeah, absolutely. So we talked about that just the fact of having hypothyroidism and take and not feeling well and putting weight on and losing your hair, um, the fact that some people are being told that there is absolutely nothing wrong with them when they totally have a cellular mm-hmm. thyroid problem. Um, we've talked about somebody who's got chronic infections or chronic inflammation. It can trigger the cell danger response, which is going to divert tryptophan away from serotonin production and towards more neurotoxic pro- byproducts, which could lead to more depression. Mm-hmm. We talked about that. Chronic inflammation depletes serotonin about 2,000 times faster than it should be depleted. And then what do we miss? Oh, we talked about bacterial consumption of tryptophan. Is there anything else you can think of that would cause somebody to be more depressed? We talked about receptor function possibly under hypothyroid state. What other things can you think of? I mean, you could have, I mean, you could have an underlying genetic SNP. I mean, that could, I mean be affecting that. I mean, and you could have that in itself could be creating more inflammation, but that also could be speeding or slowing up down the breakdown or production of the serotonin itself, which when you have the genetic SNPs, it makes you more prone to a lot of different things. And so that could play a piece in it as well. The MOA and the COMT that you were just talking about, that could play a role in it. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's lots of factors that can be responsible in depression while it's a real thing for the people that are experiencing it, SSRIs, MAO inhibitors, drugs that kind of pool serotonin can have a short-term benefit for some people. Mm-hmm. But the problem is there, there's not the long-term effects of taking them can be really damaging and even catastrophic to some people with all of the side effects that occur from it. And they're not getting to root cause, which is the most important thing. If they don't get to root cause, they don't address what's causing the autoimmune condition, they don't get to the reason that they have depression in the first place, and they're gonna wind up continuing to have more and more problems likely over time. Yeah. And, then wind up, and then wind up on the next medication or the next medication because uh, the original problem wasn't addressed. Yeah, absolutely, and just like with thyroid, you wanna find that underlying cause, and oftentimes the things that are creating the underlying thyroid dysfunction are the same things that are creating your depression and your joint pain and the reason you're gaining weight. And, you know, there's a reason the body's breaking down. And so you've got to take a step back and actually look at what's truly going on with the chemistry and try to balance it at a chemistry level instead of just trying to put a Band-Aid on it with a medication. Yeah, exactly. So if we let's let's leave uh, listeners and viewers with a couple tips. One of those is 
if they wanted to find out, um, instead of just being told you're depressed, mm -hmm. right? What is, what's some ways to be able to get the information? What kind of testing would you say might be beneficial for somebody to find out a, do they have a serotonin problem and B, um, what to do about it? Well, I think the first and the biggest one is going to be an amino and an organic acid test. I mean, that's going to give you the foundational of, you know, the breakdown of those neurotransmitters and see where is the dysfunction happening. You can see some dysbiosis and kind of pinpoint, you know, where is the, the breakdown happening? Yeah. So for somebody who you, doctors like you or I, who use an organic acid amino acid test fairly frequently, it, there's markers of malabsorption that are going to give us an indication if tryptophan is being consumed by bacterial by bacteria in the gut. And if that's the case, then we know there's that what we call tryptophan steal. The tryptophan is being stolen away from, from us to feed organisms. So we'll see that. We'll definitely see markers of bacterial overgrowth, and then we can, we can make some assumptions that there's, that's part of the issue. We can look at the neurotransmitter markers, and they can actually look good even though somebody's got depression. So they can look fairly normal. And what we have to do as physicians is we have to take a look at these other factors. If we see that the metabolites are within the normal range, then we have to look at some of these other factors. They may just be in normal range because they're not making much, yep. right? And the body's mm -hmm. trying to clear it out quickly. Um, and as a, in the process of trying to clear it out but not making much, it still makes the values look normal. And then there's a number of markers like the kinuretic acid and the quinolinic acid where we can see is though, are those pathways being pushed a little bit further or a little bit harder? And if they are, then we know that the tryptophan is going in a different direction, right? Yeah. Um, so definitely organic acid, amino acid, maybe something like a, a GI stool or a, uh, I love the GI map test. Absolutely. Uh, that test tells you a ton of stuff about what's, What's really going on? The little I call it the critters in your digestive tract. Yeah, so those two tests are, are great tests to do. Definitely, if you if you haven't worked with a health uh, functional medicine practitioner, uh, one of the things that we utilize quite a bit are uh, assessment forms, and there's questionnaires on neurotransmitter uh, on questions that would be associated with serotonin depression, serotonin deficiency. Feel the with your symptoms as to, all right, what part of the neurotransmitter system may be compromised? So between some blood work, organic acid, amino acid, maybe a GI map test, um, and assessment surveys, we can get a lot of information. Okay. There's some, uh, definitely there's some people that do neuro, urine neurotransmitter profiles. I don't use those too much in my practice to use those. No, I don't. Mm -hmm. So there's some controversy res regarding those. Um, what I've found by looking at the organic acid and amino acids, and, and Eric, I know you are, the, are similar, is that you'll see a lot of those metabolite markers on there. There's GABA's on there, mm -hmm. glutamate, glutamine. A lot of the neurotransmitters that might be on that urine neurotransmitter form are going to be on the organic acids and amino acids. So we can get a lot of that information from there. Mm -hmm. Other than that, uh, other things that people can do, we talk about this at every... <laughs> Every time we talk, that's more of an anti-inflammatory diet. Reduce that um, high processed carbohydrate load. Uh, definitely too low of carbohydrates can cause some depression, mm -hmm. but way too high of, of carbohydrate load can feed bad bacteria, stimulate chronic inflammation. So clean up your diet. Yep. Um, other factors, uh, sleep cycles, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if, if you're not sleeping, that will drive chronic inflammation. Yeah, right? if I don't sleep, I'm depressed. I mean, I know that. <laughs> so you got to sleep. You got to sleep well, and exercise is key as well. Oh, absolutely. I, I just had a call from one of our uh, uh, fellow functional medicine doctors who said um, we were talking about one of their thyroid patients, and the, he said she is working out like a mad woman, and she cannot lose weight. Um, and I said, well, that's part of her problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we talked about this, that chronic over exercising above your body's capacity is a stressor. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're a CrossFitter and you're doing CrossFit six, seven days a week, you are probably not allowing your body healing time to heal and repair. That will create chronic inflammation that will deplete your serotonin 
and that will make you depressed, yeah. right? So if you're the person who's got low thyroid function, low thyroid physiology, and you're thinking, I just have to work harder, exercise more to get rid of this weight, you may actually be making yourself worse. Mm -hmm. Not that exercise is bad, but there's a balance between overdoing it and, and underdoing it. Mm -hmm. It's something right in the middle. You have to be physically, you have to build physical strength, and you need to exercise, but if you overdo it, you don't allow your body to heal and repair, you're going to have chronic inflammation yep. and trigger more of your cellular hypothyroid state. Mm -hmm. What else did we miss? Is that it? I think that's a good synopsis of everything. Reducing inflammation, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's big. That's a big and anti-inflammatory nutrients can be beneficial, things like omega fatty acid within reason. Uh, definitely vitamin D is, is beneficial. Um, we want to be thinking, you know, B vitamins are critical, mm -hmm. especially folate, B6. Uh, you can't be anemic. You have, to, you have to have healthy red blood cell physiology. Um, there's things like resveratrol and turmeric that can be beneficial from an anti-inflammatory standpoint. You're, I'm, I know you prescribe or recommend resveratrol and turmeric at times as well, yeah, right? At times, yeah. I think for some people, they need to be cautious with turmeric to some degree. If you have low ferritin or low iron, you mm -hmm. want to be cautious with turmeric. You don't want to be taking that every day. You probably need to pulse that because yep. turmeric will uh, chelate out your iron and make you more anemic. Uh, as far as resveratrol, resveratrol is very good anti-inflammatory, but if you already have some problems with thyroid physiology, extended use of resveratrol has been shown to actually suppress thyroid function. So we got to be a little cautious with that. Yeah. And then you also have to think, you know, you're trying to reduce inflammation, but where's the inflammation coming from? You know, you always want to take that, that perspective too. So if you have a chronic inflammation or chronic infection, let's say in your, your digestive tract and you just keep taking, you know, omegas and resveratrol and turmeric trying to reduce inflammation, there's a reason why your body has inflammation in the first place. And that's really where you should be, you know, focusing in on. Right. You may give yourself an artificial sense of improvement. But really what you've done in the long run is the inflammatory process is what your cellular system is trying to do to protect itself, right? Mm -hmm. It's dumping out these, these inflammatory chemicals to go warn all the other cells in the body that, hey, I'm under stress. I'm infected. I've got some problem here. If you suppress the body's inflammatory response, then it can't warn the other tissues. And you may wind up with a more chronic systemic infection for a short-term gain of reducing inflammation you wind up, wind up with a more chronic process or more chronic problem down the road, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So I think we were pushing our time limit. So we'll, yeah. we'll wrap that up today. So today was all about that hypothyroidism and depression, a couple of reasons why you might be depressed if you have a hypothyroid condition. So we touched on a bunch of those. If you have any interest in, in finding out if either I or Dr. Erica could help you with your thyroid condition, uh, I am available at my website, www.chronicconditionrecoverycenter.com. I also have a website, uh, thyroidproblemsdoctor.com, and uh, you can always get a hold of me there um, and even on Facebook as well, at both of those places. Uh, yeah. Dr. Erica is available at? Brainandbodyhealthcenter.com, and you can find us on Facebook as well at Brain and Body Health Center. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Drs. Riggleman. Perfect. So we'll wrap up this one and we'll be back in a, in a week or two for another podcast. All right. Absolutely. All right. Take care, Dr. Yeah, Erica. You too.